Hi, and, uh, and welcome. Uh, thanks to everyone out there for tuning into this session. I'm Brad Graham, the co-owner of Politics and Prose Bookstore, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. And I'll be moderating a, a great lineup of uh, five compelling authors. Uh, this panel is titled Northern Experience, a broad title uh, meant to encompass a group of writers who produce a very different types of works, but all the authors are from the, the neighbor region, and each of their books is worthy of your attention and worth featuring at your stores. Uh, I'll introduce the authors uh, one by one. They'll talk about their books, and I'll ask a follow-up question to two of them. Uh, then we'll take questions from all of you, uh, and you can post your questions in, in the meantime in the Q&A column uh, by clicking on Q&A at the bottom of your screens. Uh, there's a, uh, also a chat button down there, but I think that's, uh, that's uh, disabled. Uh, at the outset here, I just want to thank our conference sponsors, uh, all names you'll recognize, Harper Collins, Hachette, Simon & Schuster, Sourcebooks, Blackstone Publishing, Scholastic, and Penguin Random House. I also have been asked to say that everyone should adhere to the conference's code of conduct. Also, remember that we're all considered competitors. So there can be no discussion on terms or boycotts. Please read the policies on the New Voices, New Rooms website. Now, uh, first up on the panel is Tova Felshu. Uh, we'll get Tova up here uh, with me in a minute. There's Tova. So I think Len and Alex, there you go. Um, uh, Tova, and, uh, no doubt, is very familiar to many of you. Uh, she's an accomplished actress and singer uh, who, over four decades in the entertainment business, has appeared on stage, uh, TV, and in movies, earning four Tony Award nominations and two Emmy Award nominations in the process. In recent years, uh, she gained a new generation of fans for her recurring roles on Crazy Ex-Girlfriend and The Walking Dead. And before the pandemic, she starred as Ruth Bader Ginsburg, in a stage adaptation of Sisters-in-Law. And now she's written a memoir, Lilyville, Mother, Daughter, and Other Roles I've Played, which is dedicated to her mother, Lily, and centered around the relationship between the two of them. The book is due for release in April, just in time for Mother's Day. So Tova, take it away. Hello, it is wonderful to be here. I've been Tova on Broadway. I've been Tova off Broadway. And now I'm Tova Crossover from Broadway to Zoom. I couldn't be more delighted to lose my webinar virginity to all of you today. <laughs> when Hachette first asked me to write my memoir, I could only imagine what they were envisioning. Sparkling opening nights, backstage love affairs, long rehearsals, triumphant curtain calls. There's plenty of that to be sure, but little did they know that the greatest, longest, and most profound role of my life has been the role of Lillian Kaplan Felchu's daughter, a part I never auditioned for. Since the death of my extraordinary mother at over 103 years old, I have felt an urgent need to share her story and mine and our lifelong journey to try to understand one another. Of course, I couldn't possibly envision my memoir in any other format than the one I know best, a theater piece. The book is structured in three acts and peppered with anecdotes. Here's a taste as I invite you into the theater of my memories. The phone rings, the caller ID says, Barry Weisler. And I say to myself, Broadway producer, Barry Weisler? I guess I'll pick it up. Tova, he says, we'd like you to do Pippin for us on Broadway at the Music Box Theater. Can you come down and play on the trapeze? We wanna see if trapeze is part of your world. Trapeze, part of my world, I'm thinking. So I bike down to the Music Box Theater at 45th and Broadway, and I enter the stage door. And that is my audition, mind you, playing on a trapeze. The minute I walk in, they hoist me at least 30 feet in the air, no net, no mat, no insurance. And I'm hanging from the rafters, and Barry yells up to me, Tova, 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 Tova. Are you scared, scared, scared? And I take a deep breath, and I realize, no, no, no. Are you, you, you? Without singing a note, without dancing a step, I won the role of Grandma Berta in the Broadway production of Pippin because I could swing on a trapeze. My mother Lily came to every show I ever did. Well, almost. Tova, I'm not coming to see you in the, in the Virginia monologues. I can't say the word. 
but three women in black dresses in front of three music stands talking about their chachburgers. Forget it! So, if you're pretty and there's movement and there's color, give me a ring. So I gave my mother a call and I take her to Pippin. Pippin has unbelievable color and movement. And I looked darn good in that bustier with fishnet stockings. All the trapeze work had taken me down to 112 pounds, which is exactly what I weighed in seventh grade. With joy, I took my mother with her beloved aide, Joyce, to the matinee of Pippin, that Tony award-winning revival. Grandma Berta sings the hit tune, No Time At All, which I performed while simultaneously doing a full out trapeze act. So this number brought down the house. Look, you put an old bird hanging on a trapeze singing upside down, it engenders hope in everyone. So I go to my mother after the show and I say, mommy, 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 mom, 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 mom. Suddenly I am three years old grasping for my mother's milk. Mommy, how did I do? Tauva that you should still have to earn a living like this and on a trapeze yet. That was my mother, Lily. She didn't give an inch. When I played Prime Minister Golda Meir in Golda's Balcony, which became the longest running one woman play in the history of Broadway and won me my fourth Tony nomination, my mother's comment was, Tauva, I rate your parts by how you look. Dolly Levi was a 10, Golda Meir, zero. And once, still aiming to please, I took my mother to the actor's benefit performance of Hair. It had color, it had movement, it had Will Swentz in the lead, who at the finale of Act One came out into the audience to straddle an audience member's armrest. He chose my mother Lily's armrest. I'm telling you, that boy was over my mother like the Arch of St. Louis, in his loincloth. So my mother in her little St. John's knit, she, she, she looks up, she looks down, she looks up, she looks down, and as the house lights come up, I timidly say, Mommy, what did you think of Act One? Her reply, did you like Act One, Mommy? Her reply, like it. I haven't had sex like this since Daddy died. Welcome to Lilyville, where my mother, Lily, reigns. Lily, who gave birth to this adrenaline junkie perfectionist daughter. Lilyville, where when, you wanted, when I wanted to go to Juilliard, my mother said to me, you're not going to a trade school. I dedicate this book to my mother, Lily, who now that she has left me, is always with me. I wanna make sure my daughter and my son understand this and my grandchildren as well. Lily will be in them, in their heads, in their bones, as will I, just as your forebears will be in you. When the breast was put away in an airtight brassiere by my mother six weeks after my birth, and warmth was now dominated by a shyness that no infant could comprehend. There were consequences. During more than six decades that Lily and I were figuring us out, expectations for women were being transformed again and again by the women's movement, the sexual revolution, the subsequent mandate for women to have it all. My mother and I are emblematic of the way these changes created a divide between generations and the way that it might be possible to bridge that divide through patience, compassion, and empathy. As William Saroyan put it, a branch in order to be able to bear fruit must learn to bend. And as my mother Lily put it as she endured these shifts, oi, my kishkas, that's Yiddish for guts. If you came looking for behind the scenes tales from The Walking Dead to the history making miniseries Holocaust with TV's crazy ex-girlfriend sprinkled in between, if you're looking for secret anecdotes about my roles on Broadway in Yentl, Pippin, and Golda's Balcony, with classics like Juliet and Dolly Levi folded in, it is all here. Plus encounters with Barbara Streisand, Viggo Mortensen, Liev Schreiber, Sybil Shepard, Hattie Lupone, Ruth Gordon, Garson Kanan, Nobel laureate Isaac Bashevis Singer, and Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. It's all here. Uh, there also will be births, deaths, laughter, sorrow, and even a bris. And though all my career roles have happened on Broadway, in film, television, and in concert, they all took place in Lilyville, witnessed by its monarch during her robust 103 years on this planet, and in my mind's eye, eternally after, for better or for exasperation. So come on in. I'm Jewish. We're all about schmoozing. Well, schmoozing and suffering. Well, schmoozing, suffering, and guilt. I hope you buy this book.
And now I would like to share with you some of the illustrations we hope will be in the book. This is the cover, so you should remember it. I'm very excited, it goes on sale in the spring. There is my mother, Lily, holding me in her arms. We have gone a little bit fast. I'm gonna control this myself. There's my mother, Lily, holding me in her arms. Uh, that was, uh, I think, after she put her breast milk away, but uh, she's still holding me. There's Lily and I with our 80s hairdo. Uh, I had already married the Harvard lawyer by this point, so she partially approved of me. There is Pippin. You still have to earn your living on a trapeze. There's Dolly Levi, a 10. There's Golda Meir, a zero. There's Juliet, a Christian. There's Helena Slomova from the miniseries Holocaust, who was the Czech freedom fighter. There's Daniel Melnick, Law and Order, come on, Jack, 13 seasons. There's Tova in The Walking Dead. I even became an action doll. I did, I did. I was sold at Target and at Walmart, and this is what I had to do to become an action doll. Yes, there I am as a walker, or as the Z word, which we're not allowed to say. Here is Rachel Bloom. I play her mother, Naomi Bunch, in Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Here are Patty Lupone and I in Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. And here I am doing a rap for Rachel Bloom in Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. So you thought I would be known as a mother of a loser. That's how that one starts. This is the great Ruth Bader Ginsburg that I had the honor of playing last season in California. And here I am with the actual Ruth Bader Ginsburg in chambers, both on October 23rd of last year and January, February of this year. I had the honor of meeting her several times. She was very helpful to me in uh, constructing my portrayal. And finally, here are Mama Lily and I with Goofy and Chip at the 100th anniversary of Disney. Thank you very much. There's some great parts there, Tova, and um, some great photos. Thank you. So let me, let me ask you, um, are there similarities between your process as an actor readying to perform on stage uh, and your process as a writer preparing for an audience on the, the written page? Well, Bradley, I think the most important thing for both media, mediums, is that we engage the house. So when you are live on stage, you bring the house into this event, this cellular moving live event uh, through abbreviated language, through the turn of a head, through uh, certain indications that are physical that don't have to be written. When you are drawing the audience into the canvas of a book, you need your vivid verbs, you need your language to seduce and invite the audience into, in my case, into your memories. My father, Sidney, always said, reach for the stars. If you reach for the stars, you may land on the roof. Reach for the roof, you never get off the ground. So that's what I've tried to do with this book. You know, it's my first book and uh, I have edited it so many times, getting it more and more and more specific trying to use vivid verbs, trying to carve my experience through language in order to engage the most important person, which is the reader. Thank, thank you, thank you very much, Chova. Um, hopefully there'll be some more questions for you later from the audience. Um, next up is, uh, is Leonard Downey. It's Leonard Downey Jr. Hi, Len. Uh, Len's also written, written a memoir. Len, I think you may be on mute. No, I'm not. No, you're not. Okay, good. Here we go. Uh, Len's also written a memoir. Uh, his looks back on a very successful career in journalism, one that carried him from a position as lowly summer intern at the Washington Post in 1964, up through the ranks to eventually becoming the Post's executive editor through much of the 1990s and 2000s. Uh, in the book, all about the story, Len takes readers behind the scenes at the Post and examines some of the key issues that have confronted and continue to confront editors and reporters in American newsrooms generally. Since leaving the Post 12 years ago, Len has been teaching investigative reporting and writing uh, more books to go with the four that he wrote while at the paper. Uh, I got to know Len pretty well in my own 30 years with the Washington Post before I became a bookseller. 
uh, and can attest that Len's memoir tells it like it was. It also has many relevant lessons for today. Uh, Len, your turn. I, I wrote this book to take readers inside how journalism actually worked uh, during the 44 years I was at the Washington Post as a reporter and as an editor. I, I wanted to show readers um, uh, the, the fact that we really are unbiased. And we're really dedicated to pursuit of the truth. Uh, and, uh, uh, and and how we make decisions that uh, that 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 affect the news and affect the audience as a result of the decisions we make about the news. I, I began with my with my time as a young investigative reporter, uh, doing investigations that made changes uh, that led to changes in the court system and and other things in in Washington. Uh, I I, um, I I take the reader into uh, to to, uh, to 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 the Watergate story, which I was one of the editors uh, and the and the final and, and in the final months uh, before President Nixon's uh, resignation. I was the chief editor uh, when we were covering the Senate Watergate hearings and Bob and Carl's investigations, Bob Woodward's and Carl Bernstein's investigations and so on. I, I, I take the reader to London uh, to show what it's like to be a foreign correspondent and to understand uh, how to learn about uh, what, what things are different in a foreign country and the, the number of foreign countries that I covered from London and also uh, was able to, to, to entertain readers with uh, with my coverage of uh, Prince Charles and and, uh, and Lady Diana, uh, the royal wedding, and unfortunately the the unraveling uh, of, of that marriage, uh, I, uh, I I I I take the readers to uh, inside the, the difficult decisions that we had to make about stories about national security, stories about the private lives of politicians. Uh, the investigations that the Washington Post led the way on of uh, Bill and Hillary Clinton uh, that was part of uh, the run-up to uh, to the impeachment of, of, uh, of President Clinton. I, I show the readers what it's like uh, to, uh, uh, to, to have a president and the first lady uh, be angry about the coverage we were doing, to blame me personally for coverage they didn't like, and, and, uh, and how uh, Mrs. Clinton engaged me about it, but how, uh, uh, but how Bill Clinton uh, uh, avoided confrontation and always, always treated me nicely in our, uh, in, uh, whenever we saw each other. Um, I, I, I talk about the importance of confidential sources in journalism. People, people who are critical of this call them anonymous sources. They're not anonymous. They're not only known to the reporter, they're known to the editor. I had to know the, the identity of all the uh, confidential sources that our reporters used on big stories, beginning with Watergate all the way through the rest of my career, and how important uh, that is, and, I, and how, how important it was to, to keep secret the identity of Deep Throat uh, for decades uh, before it was finally revealed by his family in a magazine. And I was often asked by people, didn't I feel badly uh, that, uh, that Vanity Fair magazine beat us to the story of the fact that Mark Felt was deep throat? Uh, and I said, no. I said, actually, I, I was pleased that, uh, that everybody could see that when Washington Post reporters uh, make an agreement, make a, make a promise, a solemn promise, not to identify a confidential source, in this case, until that, that person was no longer with us, uh, that, uh, that they would keep that promise. Uh, and uh, even, even to the point of having somebody else uh, uh, break, break the story uh, before we did. I talked about the uh, decision-making and the long count of the presidential election in 2000, which is so relevant now, how at 2.30 a.m. we had to decide whether or not the post front page that was literally on the presses, the, the, the plates were on the presses to begin uh, uh, printing uh, stories uh, that had the overall headline that Bush had won the election. Uh, before we managed to, uh, to stand, the managing editor and I were standing next to the news desk, literally with a scrap piece of paper at 2.30 in the morning uh, with the number of votes that uh, Bush was ahead in Florida and the number of votes that were still outstanding and realized there'd have to be a recount that the election was not, was not ending at that hour. And so I, I made this call down to the, to the press room and I said, please take those plates out of the press and destroy them. And we're gonna have shortly a new story coming down with the headline saying there'd be a recount in Florida and that the election was undecided. 
a number of other newspapers, I'm not going to say which ones, uh, were, not, were not so lucky and, and had headlines saying that Bush had won the election, which was wrong for at least all the months that the recount took place. The details of that, of that recount are interesting now, in particular, as we anticipate the possibility uh, that the election will not end this year uh, on, uh, on election day of November 4th. I talk about the difficulties in making decisions, as I said, about the private lives of public figures, uh, stories we did publish, stories we did not publish, but also uh, stories that, uh, that affect national security. And in one case, uh, not just the head of the CIA, in the number of times the head of the CIA asked me not to publish a story that we did publish, but that the President of the United States, George W. Bush, asked us not to publish a story about CIA secret prisons in, uh, in Europe, uh, where terrorist suspects were, were we turned out, it turned out we were being tortured, and how I go about making a decision like that. Never did I not publish a story when it was demanded by a public official, but often we would withhold some details that were not that important for readers' understanding of the story that might reveal the name of a covert operation, or in particular to leave out names of, of people who might be harmed uh, by that story. Uh, that, that, that's, that's why I wanted to take readers inside at a time when uh, there are all these allegations and misunderstandings about the role of the media. Well, you had an amazing run at the, at the Washington Post, Len. I think you were there, what, 40, 44 years, all yeah. told. Um, you mentioned um, editing uh, the Watergate story and um, working with Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein um, when you were just uh, early on becoming an editor. And of course, uh, Bob is, uh, is in the news again yes. with his latest book, Rage, about Donald Trump. Uh, a recurring issue with Woodward is how he balances his book writing with his reporting for the Washington Post. And you say in your book that you never found this to be an untenable conflict, but you also say, Bob, uh, it wasn't always easy for you to manage. Right. Talk about managing Woodward. And, and, and do you think in the current case that he should have gone public earlier about some of his uh, reporting and what he was finding out about Donald Trump and what Trump knew about the uh, coronavirus. While I was executive editor of the Post, Bob wrote, I don't know, eight books, something like that, um, particularly about the administrations of Bill Clinton and George W. Bush and the, and the wars in the, in the Middle East. Um, we had a much closer relationship with the paper then than I think he does now. Uh, he, for a while, was the head of our investigative unit. Uh, so even though he went off for long periods of time to write books, he was always available when we needed him for investigative reporting. On 9-11, for example, he just came right in the newsroom without being asked and spent weeks doing a very important investigative reporting about the attacks on the United States and what went wrong. Uh, and also, he would come to me. Uh, I, I, the, the difficulty of man managing him was he wouldn't tell me what he was doing much of the time when he was working on a book. I'd have to kind of draw him out on it. Uh, and, but occasionally he would come to me and say, I just found out something that really ought to be published now, uh, either by another Washington Post reporter who we'd give the information to, or by Bob himself, if he changed, could change the ground rules with the source who thought he was only talking to him about a book so he could put a story in the newspaper. So, and in addition to that, before each book came out, we would run a multi-part series of all the best information in that book in the Washington Post. So our readers were never cheated by his book writing. Now, I don't know what his relationship is with the Post now, and I don't know if there were any conversations with the Post about what the president was telling him in all these phone calls. Uh, and so it's difficult for me to make a to, to have an opinion about what he should have done or what the Post should have done if, in fact, he was telling them what he was knowing. Uh, as Bob, Bob himself has said, he wasn't sure the president was telling the truth in those early conversations. He had to do more reporting to find out exactly what the president knew and when he knew it and what he was telling the public. And also, if he had gone public, with it then. And so I don't know if he would have saved any lives, as, as people say, by making it public then. But also the uh, conversations would have ended undoubtedly with the president. We would have not had now in his book so much else of what is important about what the president said to him against Bob's reporting about what really happened. Okay, thanks, Len. Um, next up is, uh, is Alex. Hey, Brad. Yeah, Alex, you got to click yep. your video. Uh, yep. There we go. There we go. Great. So from memoir, we now move to true crime thriller. And this is Alex Trisnowski. 
Uh, Alex used to write for Time and People magazines. Uh, he also has written uh, more than 20 previous books covering a wide range of subjects, uh, but, but they were mostly done in the voices of others, like, like Waking Up in Heaven, which is a, uh, it was an account of a school teacher in Oklahoma about a seeming near-death experience, uh, or Labor of Love, about the first uh, a transgen transgender guy to have a baby, or the vendetta about FBI agent Melvin Purvis, who became the basis for the 2009 Johnny Depp movie, Public Enemies. Uh, but when Alex came across the idea for his new book, The Rope, uh, it struck him as so good that he wanted to tell it in his own voice. Uh, it's the story of the shocking murder in 1910 of a 10-year-old girl in Asbury Park, New Jersey, and the effort to find her killer. Alex not only recounts this long forgotten crime as a page turning thriller, he also casts it in the context of the dawn of modern criminal detection and the launch of the NAACP. Uh, the release date is, uh, is next February. Uh, Alex? Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Appreciate that. I uh, can't believe I've got to follow Tovu Felchu and the executive editor of the Washington Post. But, uh, you know, I worked at People Magazine and I didn't do the Kardashian stuff there. Actually, I did the um, true crime stuff and human interest stuff. And actually, our true crime stories were 10 times as popular as anything else in the magazine. You know, th this is what our readers enjoyed reading about. Most of all, the darkest, uh, you know, criminal stories that we had. And um, so I've always, uh, you know, like a lot of authors enjoy that kind of story, you know, the sort of dark side of humanity. And um, I came across this story about the murder of a 10 year old schoolgirl in Asbury Park. Her name is Marie Smith. She was found in the woods and uh, of the case that followed, the search for her killer. And um, it seemed like a wonderful story on its own. The lead detective was a rookie detective who had never worked a murder case before. And uh, the main suspect was a black itinerant worker in town who uh, most of the population there in 1910 uh, wanted to just storm the jail, take him out and lynch him as was happening all over the place. And, uh, you know, it was interesting to see how that played out. It's a very psychological thriller because the detective employed methods that had never been used before uh, to basically get the person that he thought had committed the murder to confess. And he went to great lengths and employed a lot of psychological tricks. And um, it's the story of that. But the more I researched it, the more I saw that it was even a bigger story because the Marie Smith case turned out to be the third case ever handled by the NAACP back in 1910. And I thought there was um, something interesting there. So I kind of wanted to tell the two stories of this murder and the um, a small scale evil of the killer in that one against the backdrop of the birth of the NAACP and the larger evil of a lynching and, uh, and all the, the agitation that led to the creation of the NAACP and, and ended up with a couple of lawyers from the NAACP ending up in the courtroom defending the main suspect, Tom Williams. So it, it's a joining of these two stories. It's, um, you know, I started working on it long before the, uh, the murder of George Floyd, but as I went along, it just seemed very relevant. I mean, everything that I was researching is is relevant today. It's this, um, you know, a lot of people, when they see events happen today, it, it feels like uh, American history repeating itself. And I could see how that was the case. It was all of these systems that just simply didn't work for a certain percentage of the population and uh, they were entrenched and to uproot them, you needed incredible heroism from individuals uh, like my two main characters, the detective Raymond Schindler, and the, the great heroic Ida Wells, who, who fought tirelessly for decades to bring the true story of lynching to life. So it's, um, it sort of combines those two stories. And uh, actually, before I started it, I knew a little bit about it. I saw that it hadn't been written about too much elsewhere. But the first thing I did was uh, I knew where little Marie Smith was buried in a little plot in Holy Cross Cemetery in Brooklyn. And so I went there. And I couldn't find her grave at all. So I uh, asked the superintendent there to help me find it. He couldn't find it. We looked for about 20 minutes and finally found just a little piece of land overgrown by shrubs 
and weeds stuck between two other tombstones. And uh, the superintendent said, that's it, that's your grave. It was not marked in any way. It was overgrown. It was basically a forgotten little piece of, of land. And uh, that's when I sort of felt, you know, this is, a, this is a girl who lived in matter and is now almost forgotten. So I, it was sort of my goal to bring her to life a little bit. And uh, when I finished the book, I promised I would go to the cemetery and finally put down a marker for her, which I recently did. So it became a personal story for me to tell and hopefully it will resonate with a lot of people given today's climate. Thanks, Brad. Well, thank, thank you, Alex. It uh, uh, sounds very compelling. Uh, what, what, what was it like doing uh, this book in, in your own voice? I mentioned in the intro that so many of your previous books had been done um, in other people's voices. It's a, it's a strange thing. I don't know why, but my particular talent I found is channeling other people's voices, you know, and I've worked with the NFL players and uh, undercover FBI agents, school teachers, you name it. Uh, I just sort of slip into their lives pretty easily. I don't know what that says about me, but it's something that's been positive for me to do that. I get to live a lot of different lives and get myself into a lot of people's heads. And, and this was much more uh, challenging for me, actually. You know, um, as every author here knows, you've got to find a voice that that works for you. And if it's a memoir or if it's a true crime story, you know, you, you have to guide readers from the beginning to the end in a, in a compelling way. And, you know, you don't want to get in the way. You don't want to overtell the story. So it, it was much more challenging for me to, to put something in my own voice at the same time, much more satisfying too. Can you talk a little more about what the significance of this case was for the development of the NAACP? You know, you said it just formed a year, year before. Right. Uh, you know, and uh, when the NAACP formed, uh, it was having trouble. I mean, its first year in business, they basically had, you know, I, I looked at their financial records. There might have been a time when they had $52 and 10 stamps in their treasury. And um, they had trouble getting people to contribute and donate money. So uh, what they needed was a better focus in their first year, you know, and that's understandable for any organization. But finally, they did find their focus as uh, litigious. You know, they, they wanted to find cases that they could actually send lawyers to and help decide law. And, and that really happened with three cases. Uh, the Pink Franklin case was their first case ever handled, then another person uh, who they tried to lynch, Steve Green. And then finally, the case in Asbury Park. That was the third case they ever handled. And after that, they became um, a little more involved in, you know, the legal arm of the NAACP began to grow and grow and grow. And that really marked you know, a turning point in their activism after one year of sort of just trying to figure out what they were doing. So, you know, they, they played an impact on a very small scale with this suspect, uh, Black Diamond was his nickname, but also it marked the beginning of, you know, what would eventually lead to Thurgood Marshall and, and others like that. Thank you, Alex. Um, we, have, we have two more authors to go, but let me just uh, again invite uh, all of you out there watching to post your questions in the, the Q&A uh, column by clicking on the, the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screens, uh, because we're gonna have a few minutes at the end to, uh, to go to audience questions. Um, so uh, let's see, next up is Nadia. Hello. Hello, uh, Nadia, Nadia Hashimi. Um, Nadia became a, a, a novelist almost as an afterthought as a Washington Post profile once said of her. She's a pediatrician by training who started writing her first book about a dozen years ago while pregnant with her first child. For subject matter, she drew then and has continued to draw her subsequent novels on her Afghan heritage. She was born in the United States, but her parents came from Afghanistan, which they left in the early 1970s before the Soviet invasion. Her novels have tended to span generations and continents, taking on such themes as forced migration, conflict, poverty, misogyny, colonialism, and, and addiction. In her new book, Sparks Like Stars, uh, an Afghan-American woman returns to Kabul to learn the truth about her family and the tragedy that destroyed their lives. Uh, the book is, uh, is a work of historical fiction 
centered around the 1978 coup when communists overthrew Afghanistan's progressive president uh, and the Soviet invasion, of course, followed the next year. Um, so Nadia, take it away. Thank you so much, Bradley. And let me first say thanks to the organizers for giving us this platform to get together. Um, right now, it's it's just extra good to be able to connect with other people who are in the business of books and talk about stories and appreciate all the panelists so far. So I'm really excited to introduce this story. This has, I mean, every book is a labor of love, but this one is a little bit different for me. Um, as Bradley mentioned, I, I lean into my heritage. Uh, my parents, um, my husband as well, was born and raised. He was born and raised in that house and left in the early 90s. So a very different experience than mine. Um, and I've always leaned into the, the history of the country and what's happening. Uh, over the course of at least the past century in all of my stories. In this particular story, am I a little could bit I spotty for you all? Yeah. Could I interrupt for a, a sure. second? I think the sound is coming through a little bit interrupted. Um, um, like there's a connection loose or something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, let's see, my Wi-Fi is on full blast. We know how to practice that. That's good when you're talking. That, now, it is it fine good. now? Yeah, now it sounds good. So, okay. Well, we'll. I'll keep my fingers crossed, and and you'll let me know if I need to pause. Um, and so this is one where I lean more into my own personal experience than in previous books. And this story starts off in 1978 in Kabul, and goes from there, for, uh, starting at the time of the coup, the message is that it's not sounding good, but, um, goes from the time of a very brutal and almost surgical <laughs> coup that happened in the presidential palace in which the military turned their guns uh, inward and assassinated the then president and all of his family members, and the bodies of those assassinated were disappeared that night. So from that night, we continue on, um, and that's in a 1978 couple where we're meeting the elites of high society, we're meeting international diplomats and people who are getting together for cocktail parties, and then you've got the hippies wandering down the hippie trail and, and enjoying all, that, uh, all of the herbs that Afghanistan had to offer at that time. And so it's a very, very different picture than most people think of when they think of Afghanistan. Going from there, we see a major change and we're following the life of Sitara. Sitara is a young girl who happened to be in the palace that night and was the witness and a survivor to that coup. Uh, she is escaped from there and taken by a soldier to an American woman who is living and working in Kabul as an American diplomat from the Foreign Service. Uh, and then from there, her life is transposed into the United States and she grows up in the United States partly um, and ends up becoming a physician in New York City and that's where we meet her again for the second half of the book and this is where it really draws on my personal experience. Now I grew up in the United States but my life kind of spans this before and after that's cut by 9-11 um, and so I've watched Afghanistan kind of tumble into this decades of war over the course of my lifetime. And I've also watched my American identity change drastically because of an event that happened in New York City while I was a medical student in Brooklyn. And so all of this kind of comes together, taking a look at the Cold War situation in Afghanistan, the push and pull between the United States and the Soviet Union, and what effect that had on the country and on the government of the country, and the tensions really coming to a point during that that coup and then also how that plays out later in life with 9-11 and what it means for those who are living in the united states having that afghan identity um, sitara in this story when she is in new york city is kind of she's buried her past but pasts don't stay buried and uh, that trauma has to be dealt with and so in this story it's really one about identity. It's uh, talking about reinvention and forgiveness because Satara is facing the soldier who she had, uh, who she had encountered at the assassination that night. 
and that soldier walks into her clinic. And so, like I said, the past never stays buried. Uh, this is a story of tragedy, of survival, and I believe will give readers uh, a closer look at the political landscape, but also an intriguing story to follow as we watch Sitara kind of grapple with all that she has dealt with in her past and the future that lays before her. Thank you, Nadja. What, what, uh, what was, um, more specifically, the inspiration for, for this book? So this book really is one that I will say is, is born out of the many, many conversations I've had with book clubs around my previous books. Um, one of the questions that always comes up, and I do a lot of book clubs, uh, I've always done a lot of book clubs virtually, I'm doing more now, and so I'm always happy to connect with readers. And one of the questions that always comes up is, you know, what happened to Afghanistan? And, and when I tell people that my mother became a civil engineer in Afghanistan and, and dressed, you know, at the way that I'm dressing now, people are often surprised by that sense of society and by that kind of a shift. And so I wanted to really take on the question of, what happened? What were the conditions that led uh, to this kind of a, a, a situation where you could then find the country in 40 years of war, especially now where at this moment, actually, Afghanistan is a, at, a, at a very, very pivotal moment in its, in its uh, course because we're waiting to see what's going to happen in the world of women's rights as the United States draws down and as the Afghan government is now engaging with talks in talks with the Taliban. And so the future for Afghan women is really up in the air. The future for the country is really up in the air. And I think it's always wise to go back in time and take a look at the many, many factors that led us to this point. So this is so really- um, That 78 coup mm -hmm. engineered by the communists, I guess, was really the tipping point. In my mind it is, yes. Yeah. And so, and so what did the research for this book involve? The research was, was um, I mean, research for any book is wonderful, <laughs> but the research for this book was amazing because I got to speak to American Foreign Service officers, um, and in particular women who were working in Kabul, and, and one in, in particular was very helpful. I interviewed her and she gave me amazing details. And so one of the things that you'll see in this story is that uh, the American embassy, the people who were working at the American embassy, down to the Marines who were guarding the embassy, decided to put on a show. They put on the play Oklahoma. And that's something that they actually did. You know, it was a, it was a party post. It was an exotic post and they were having a great time. And so they're putting on this show. Um, and it's kind of interesting and hard to imagine American Foreign Service officers having such an easy time in Kabul that they're actually putting on uh, a musical to entertain themselves and the other diplomats and people who were in town at that time. Uh, I got to dig into, you know, the hippie trail. I, I drew a line in my research uh, of, about what I was doing there. Um, but speaking with Afghans as well, my husband's father, so my father-in-law was pretty heavily involved with the government at the time too. So interviewing him about the details of the presidential palace and then his personal theory, since he was there, near there at the time, about the assassination and who really masterminded all of it. Fascinating stuff. Um, Thank you very much. Um, all right, our, our fifth panelist is, uh, is Morgan. Hi, can you see me? I can't see you yet, Morgan. Uh, do you wanna, act? there you go, now we can see you. Uh, there is um, Morgan Rogers, um, who says she's always uh, wanted to be a writer uh, but in school, uh, she pursued other, other studies. She earned a degree in speech pathology and audiology, and then worked several different jobs uh, related to medical care uh, for a while as a cancer aide uh, in medical insurance uh, and at a pharmacy lab. Uh, for the past several years, she's held a job in a law library, uh, but she decided to, to write on the side um, and as a, a queer millennial, drew on her own experience. In just six months, Six months, she composed Honey Girl, uh, her first novel, uh, which is due out in February. It follows a young black woman just finishing her PhD in astronomy, who goes on a girl's trip to Las Vegas to celebrate, impulsively gets married to a girl she doesn't know, 
uh, and then decides to leave a perfectly ordered life for a summer in New York with the wife um, she still doesn't know very well. Um, Morgan? Uh, hi, uh, thanks everyone for having me. Um, I'm Morgan, I'm 28 from Baltimore. Um, so I decided to use a lot of my own experiences um, to write Honey Girl. Um, I wanted to uh, be able to kind of funnel my life and the life of my friends um, into a book. Um, so uh, like Bradley said, I grew up always wanting to write. I went to Barnes & Noble with my grandparents every weekend. I worked as a bookseller um, from when I was 16 all the way until when I graduated college. Um, so I knew I always wanted to kind of be in the industry in some way. Um, so I actually started writing. I got my writing start through fan fiction, actually, um, as a child that was raised by the internet. Um, so I kind of cut my teeth on uh, fan fiction and the reviews of strangers that you don't know and them having no issue letting you know um, if your writing is good or bad or anything in between. Um, so I feel like that really helped me kind of hone um, my writing skills. I met a lot of different writers um, with a lot of different strengths and and approaches to writing that way. Um, and I've met like lifelong friends that way. So when I, it came time for me to tell this story, I felt really prepared and like I had already had sort of a support network um, for Honey Girl. So I got the idea actually I'll say December. Um, it was like Christmas. I was home um, for the holidays, and I just finished reading um, some books uh, during that Christmas week. And I was like, you know, I really want to write this trope that I like, um, this trope which is married in Vegas. So that was really just the idea that I had for Honey Girl. That was the starting point. Um, and I said, okay, where can we go from here? I want to have a black queer girl. Um, and I've always kind of been fascinated with space. I think that um, the study of space ties into a lot that's involved with blackness and queerness and um, kind of feeling alone with the world being so big and uh, we have the stars and we have galaxies and we have these planets that are, are awe-inspiring but also terrifying. So it's so easy to feel very small um, and I think that can kind of be mirrored in the real world. So for my main character, Grace Porter, she's studying space. She's also in this, um, she's in Portland. Um, so she's in this kind of very academic, very wide environment, um, studying this very big world. And she's also in this very big world of um, academics and astronomy where she's really the minority in, in all respects. She's a woman, she's black, and she's queer. Um, so to kind of go to Vegas after working so hard for this PhD and let loose and to realize this is what I've just done, I've just gotten married, it's really um, a vehicle for her to explore the thing that she never really got a chance to do in her youth. Um, you know, she was in college, she had to put her head down, she had to study and please her parents, which is something I think a lot of people um, can relate to. Um, so she spends the summer in New York with this wife, her wife, Yuki, who has this uh, late night radio show um, that delves into urban legends um, and Japanese um, yokai. So like the monsters and the, the kind of tales we tell kids in the dark. Um, so there's also this connection of feeling othered. Um, that they both have that experience with as queer women of color. Um, so they relate very heavily to this idea of monsters, of being feared, um, of not being let into spaces, um, of feeling like you're too much. You don't want to be angry. You don't want to say the wrong thing. Um, so they very much relate to this feeling of monsters, which Yuki uses uh, to draw what she calls her lonely creatures. That's what she calls her listeners. Um, and Grace really feels compelled to that, um, being someone who's felt so lonely and othered um, in her field of astronomy and studying these huge uh, masses and rocks and, and balls of fiery gas that she can never really touch or, or reach. Um, so I think that's the connection for them. In Vegas, uh, there's also kind of this idea in the book of 
what I call found family, which is also a trope, um, very heavy in in fan fiction. And I think in real life, it mirrors the the experiences of queer people. A lot of times, there's not the support of your own blood family. There's not the support of your colleagues or maybe people you you grew up with. So you kind of build your own family. You build people. Um, a connection with people that share your values, um, that you can communicate with, that you can trust, and that you can be vulnerable with. I think that's really the essence of Honey Girl, is is finding the other people on the margins, the other people that have been othered, really, uh, the people that are kind of lost in space, that are very small and unseen. Um, those people can be your friends because they understand you in a way that other people can. They understand the the scared parts of you. They understand the angry parts of you. They understand the parts that are, are monstrous, the, the dark thoughts that we may have as a result of marginalization. Um, so I think that was really the core of Honey Girl for me. Um, as I was writing, I listened to an artist called Neo who has an, an album called Saturn, which is very, much an album themed with space, um, with people relating to being lost and gravity and feeling untethered to something, which I think is it's really relatable to my age group, um, to my fellow uh, queer community, um, to my fellow black people and black women, especially in the time that we're living in. Um, I definitely think that it all kind of ended up being very connected to this feeling of otherness and and feeling like it's okay to be that person with teeth and with claws and the person that other people fear because if that's who they want to make you then you, you have to make your way in this world um you have to make your own path and i think that's really what what grace and her wife yuki and all of their friends come to learn um, is you can be small, but it doesn't mean your voice is small. Um, it doesn't mean that the legacy you leave behind is small. It doesn't mean your impact is small, um, because Grace is a black queer woman in astronomy. Um, so there's going to be someone that comes behind her that sees she did this, and now I can follow in those footsteps. Um, so I think that's really what Hunting Girl is about. Um, for me, in general, as a writer, it's just about being able to write characters that people can identify with, especially people that have been traditionally and historically marginalized. Um, so it was really important for me to kind of have that representation on the page in a book, but also as a writer, people can see that if I can do it, they can also, you know, be in this industry um, and make their own path. Looks like there's quite a bit of depth to, to your, your book, Morgan. Um, let me ask a process question. You know, the, the book business is, is filled with stories of authors who took years to write their books uh, and only then um, face years of a struggle more to find an agent and a publisher. Uh, but your experience was different. You know, I mentioned that you wrote your book uh, pretty quickly, uh, but then you had also a relatively easy time getting published. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did. Um, I don't know if easy is the word. I was definitely stressed, but it was it was lucky because I did know, um, like I told you, I know Christina Lauren, and they've always been such big believers in me and my talent. And so when I wrote this book, they were like, we are giving it to our agent. So while I cold queried, I also had that connection um, to their agent, Holly Root, who I ended up signing with. Well, all first-time authors should be so fortunate. Um, <laughs> Congratulations. All right, we've got some minutes left for uh, audience Q&A. So if all the um, panelists could now activate their videos, we can we can see each other uh, here at, at the same time. Um, and there's a question uh, for, uh, for all of you. Uh, Liz Decker asks um, uh, what, what each of uh, you is, is reading right now. So who wants to, who wants who wants to go first? Well, not surprisingly, I'm reading Bob Woodward's book uh, *Rage*. <laughs> uh, but then a neighbor of mine 
a very successful lawyer in Washington who was very interested in my book said, can we make a trade? I want to give you a book that I wrote about my year in Vietnam, and I will give that to you if you give me a copy of your book. And we did that yesterday, and I'm astonished by what he has. It's a self-published book from some years ago, and he not only is very um, terrifically descriptive about his own time in Vietnam, but also the all the politics and everything surrounding it, and McNamara and, and Lyndon Johnson and so on, but he also goes back to World War I and makes the comparison uh, between uh, the Britain, British experience in World War I, which was a lot like the American experience in Vietnam, which is they lost a lot of lives for not much good reason in most people's expectations. And so he went back to the literature of it, and particularly the poetry of it, and includes relevant passages from literature and relevant poetry in this book. And it's remarkable. It was not a book that was you know, made for sale. He said he wrote it for his children and friends and so on. And it's a treasure. It's a wonderful thing that happened to me. Who else wants to say what they're reading? I'm, I'm, reading, my, I'm reading my life. So far. Should I speak? Yeah, go ahead, Tova. Go ahead. I'm reading my life so far. I've, I've read my life so far by Jane Fonda. And most importantly, these are the days of awe. So I'm into the prayer book because we're between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. When it is appropriate to ask for forgiveness, uh, you can ask forgiveness from God, try to solve your problems with him if he exists. But between man and man, you have to go to another person and say, if I've done anything to you consciously or unconsciously, I ask your forgiveness. And then I say, and I also will forgive you consciously or unconsciously for things you've done to me if you buy a hardcover of Lilyville. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I loved all the presentations. They were wonderful. And great congratulations, Morgan, for diving into the universal with such a uh, courage and such rapidity. Uh, all I could think about is what we're facing with elections coming. So between you and Lena and Thank Alex you. speaking for the voice list and, and uh, Nadia too. So Alex, Nadia, and Megan, do you want to say what you're reading? I'll, I'll chime in. I'm, uh, so I'm reading two. I guess I have to balance my reads on the one hand. I'm reading a book, uh, that is a nonfiction called Anxiety for Kids. So um, I've got four kids at home who are basically all in elementary school and um, it just seems like a relevant read right now. <laughs> and I'm also reading uh, The Beekeeper of Aleppo, which is uh, beautiful and kind of in line with the types of uh, themes that I like taking on myself. Alex? Uh, well, I, basically I've been watching a lot of Netflix lately. So um, you're not alone there. <laughs> I'm binging Ozark. So, you know, then I'll get back to reading. But I am reading a book called The Overstory by Richard Powers, which is just a beautiful book about our relationship to nature. And it's a challenging book. And um, so uh, I, I don't read as much as I'd like to, though. Netflix. Yeah. Morgan? Um, yeah, well, I won't leave um, Alex alone. I am on Netflix, too, watching my comfort movie, uh, Scooby-Doo Zombie Island. But I am also reading a novella called The Monster of Ellen Haven. Um, it's a novella by uh, Tor Books. So before we sign off, let's remind everybody watching when your books are coming out. Lens is already out. It came out this week, uh, a couple days ago. Uh, but your others, the others uh, of your, your books are coming out after the first of the year. Um, so Tova's, I know I also mentioned it's coming out Mother's Day next, around Mother's Day next April. Uh, Nadia, when's yours coming out? Mine will be out in March. So I've got a little bit of a wait, but I'm looking forward to 2021 for lots of reasons. Alex? Uh, early February of next year. Once the election stuff's over. <laughs> if it's ever over. Right. And Morgan? Uh, mine is out February 23rd. Um, OK, final. Uh, a final a couple sentences from each of you, if you'd like. Anybody want to say anything in closing? Several people have mentioned the election. I think it's going to be very important for all Americans, and particularly those of us who write and have access uh, to audiences, 
uh, to be watching very closely how this election is conducted. Uh, I, in, 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 in part of my past, I was involved with, uh, with investigations of voting rights. Uh, clearly, there are big issues about people's access to the polls. Uh, and uh, what's going to happen at the polls and how the votes are going to be counted, what's going to happen in the courts and so on. And I think that those of us who are opinion leaders ought to be watching that closely and be prepared to raise our voices if necessary. Yeah, no matter what, what happens, there are going to be books. You know, I think after one thing we saw after the last election, 2016, the last presidential election, is there are a lot of people came into our stores, you know, looking for comfort and solace and guidance and information, you know, to try to understand what happened. And um, I think that may happen again this time. Tova, did you want to say something? C country over party. I think it's very important for those who love us who are, I'm, I'm jumping in here, who are diehard Republicans to remind them of their wonderful conscience. What, what does it mean to live a moral life? And uh, we, we simply have to save our democracy. You know, we just have to stand up and do what Morgan says, have a voice just because you think you're voiceless. We have a voice and I'm, I'm on a calling bank for the swing states and I hope to hell it's effective, but I, I can't live with myself unless I put some sweat equity into this. Nadia, anything to learn from Afghanistan? <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, there's so much, obviously, as a pediatrician, um, as a mom, as someone who's involved with uh, local organizations here, there's a lot to care about domestically. But I, I also take a look at what's happening with our foreign policy. And it's so important to have someone leading this country who has some kind of understanding of what policy means, who has a willingness to pick up a book every once in a while and take a look at history and to understand, you know, what they may be walking into uh, and what they might be, you know, revisiting because they just disregarded the lessons of the past. So I do hope everyone gets out and vote. My, my kids and I were doing yes. postcards to swing states and we'll see what happens. Alex? Uh, I want to second all of that. Uh, the last line of my book is, uh, one of the last lines is, uh, we are never better as humans than when we're giving voice to the voiceless. And so whatever voice we may have, use it. Use it like hell, you know? And also I'd like to say, I wish I was Morgan at 28 years old and had written a book that personal uh, at 28, so. As the, as the youngest among us, Morgan, uh, by far, <laughs> In some cases, you want to speak, you want to speak for the millennials? Um, really, all I want to say is uh, thank you for having me. I hope everyone can find something to identify with. Um, I want to say that um, this book is especially for black women and um, queer black women. And I know that it's the world is very, very big and scary um, right now, but um, we have always thrived and we have always found a way and we will continue to do so. Well, that's a great note to end on. Um, and in closing, I'd like to thank all the panelists to Tova, Len, Alex, Nadia and, and Morgan. Uh, and thanks as well to, uh, to everyone uh, who's tuned in.